Gothic building at the east end of Freeman Street, Leicester, is frequently mistaken for a church. Although it has served this purpose in the course of its existence, it was built to house the collegiate school for boys in the 1830s. For 29 years, it continued to provide an education for the young gentlemen of Leicester. But then, an ex-headmaster, and a reverend gentleman at that, decided to call in the mortgage which he held on the building. Unfortunate for the young gents, but fortunate for the young ladies. For it so happened that from the nearby village of Tiworth Harcourt, Betsy Islip, widow and relict to the congregational minister of that place, was in search of a building to house her school for the daughters of the middle classes. From Joseph Swain, a Leicester grocer, who had bought the buildings as a speculation, Betsy purchased, in the first instance, the headmaster's house, the boarding accommodation, and the porter's lodge. Thus, in February 1867, began the collegiate school for girls. Today, much of the original building remains, adapted, re-equipped, but retaining still much of the atmosphere of former days, despite the fact that since the end of the 19th century, it has been encircled, if not engulfed, by the tide of urban development. The lawns, the orchard within the precincts, have long since disappeared as additional classrooms became necessary. Deplorable though such developments may have been in the aesthetic sense, they were inevitable as the course of education progressed and as extended curriculum and changing methods of teaching made their imperative demands. Ripsy Islip, indefatigable educationist herself, would have approved. The range of subjects taught today reflect both the almost forgotten struggle for the liberation of women and the importance of the tasks they fulfill in the 20th century. Open Day demonstrates to parents not simply the liberality of the education of the modern girl student, but the attention to detail, the study in depth that is essential if the innumerable problems of the mid-20th century are to be comprehended. Not that the immediate successors of Mrs. Islip were unaware of the ever-widening horizons for their young ladies. They most certainly were concerned to advance the interests of the whole school and awaken a general desire for intellectual pursuits and presented a course of instruction formidable for its content. specialist in Swedish gymnastics taught the girls. It is a tradition maintained still. Back in 1912, after a larger gymnasium had been built, the school inspectors reported that it was a pleasure to watch the girls, not only performing the gymnastic exercises, but dancing also. Music 
has always been on the curriculum. And in the school hall, the music of Benjamin Britten is rehearsed for an important occasion. The centenary speech day to be held in the de Montfort Hall. personalities, this was an occasion at which a sense of history played a significant part. followed by the centenary thanksgiving service in the cathedral church of St. Martin. with the school remain, and the thriving Old Girls Association made its own contribution to the centenary celebrations. The cross was once a popular game, but its declining popularity and the difficulties encountered in finding opponents led to its eventual abandonment. By way of something special, the Old Girls Association decided to revive the game for at least one special occasion. Presentation completed. The struggle commenced. Persuasion, if not force, had managed to raise a couple of teams. And the Victoria Park witnessed this classic conflict on a sunny day in spring. the long-established tradition of Swedish drill, gymnastics, and athletic activity now paid dividends. 
if muscles long unaccustomed to such vigorous activity complained later, they were not a subject for discussion. The old girls had proved their point. The honor of the school was maintained. No less eagerly anticipated was the association's special meeting. Among the platform party were a former headmistress, former members of staff, and several old girls who had distinguished themselves in various ways. Each of the 300 and more members was presented to the distinguished guests and to Miss Couthard, the present headmistress. reminiscences of earlier days. Miss D.R. Smith, who was headmistress before Miss Coulthard took on the arduous task, remarked on the greater freedom enjoyed by the young girl of today. And yet, in spite of change, there remained a continuity of purpose, and there was a continual need for women whose approach to the problems of living was based on sound principles. Dr. Margaret Morton also spoke. A missionary doctor now returned to Africa. She had much to say in tribute to the school as a place where inspiration to serve was never lacking. Mrs. Pauline Varley, formerly Miss Pauline Voss in her school days, and now Mrs. Perkins of the radio epic The Archers, spoke of the way in which the school drama and elocution classes had helped her in her career. Mentioning also her associations with the Little Theatre Leicester and the Attenboroughs of film and television fame, she noted how the city and the school in its turn had sent out a number of people who were now well known in the theatre. made several wry references to the undeniable fact that in her days at collegiate she was not an academic ornament. Her activities in the art department were fraught with danger and apparently invariably confused. Nevertheless, beneath the humour was a sincere affection for the old school. gratitude to the full life of the past and forward to the new life of the years ahead.